everybody. Welcome back for those of you that have been with us this morning and for those of you who have just joined. A very warm welcome to you. We've had a very interesting morning. We've been hearing about what we can learn from China about the future of social media and consumer engagement from, from over there. Uh, we've been hearing about what's hot in um, Createch in advertising and we are about to hear a, a wonderful case study where um, it really is epitome of what Createch is all about the kind of confluence of technology and creativity and the fact that we are now working in global environments with you know collaboration across across borders um, which is just wonderful that we are able to do all that please join the conversation hashtag create uk uh, or hashtag cogx 2021 uh, it is now my great pleasure to hand over to stefan pretorius who is cto at wpp who will be moderating the next session for you thank you christine great to be here today um coming to you from sea containers house just a little bit down the river from um from where you are. Um, it's great to be here today. Thank you very much for the kind of introduction. And um, as you said today, I'm gonna to be hosting a wonderful panel um, with some real expert practitioners to talk to you about the, the impact of, of technology on creativity. Um, as, as all of you know, um, technology has played a massive role in how we have made creative work over the last couple of decades um, in terms of how we make special effects, um, how we do computer graphics. Um, and then, you know, today really, the sort of next level or the next frontier of, of technology innovation is really this, this kind of quest to, to create hyper-real, immersive, entirely contextualized um, content um, for consumers to experience brands, entertainment, media, etc. And, and we see this around us all the time. So we, we see how you know um, wonderful stages are being created for things like the Mandalorian. We see how um, computer graphics are becoming so real that that you know as you as you drop into these kind of multiplayer games, um, it's almost as if you are in a real world. And the the sort of boundary between what's what's real and virtual has really become very narrow. So to help us explore that today, we we're going to talk um, um, you through a wonderful case study, a collaborative project that we conducted and uh, still kind of building on. But, but you know, really kicked off at the end of last year with our partners at Volvo, um, a long-standing WPP client, um, as well as Microsoft and NVIDIA. Sadly, the, the NVIDIA people can't be here today because it's probably about 4 a.m. in the morning in, in, um, uh, on the West Coast. Um, but I'm joined today here by, by three guests um, who will talk us through the, um, the project and the detail of how we, how we conducted that. So joining me here today is firstly Matthias um, Wickenmalm. Um, he's a, an artist and technologist, uh, and I say that with the greatest respect. Um, Matthias, if you, if you search for him online, is, 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 is responsible for some of the most beautiful and iconic renders of cars, um, I think, um, available still online today. Um, he's got several patents pending in this area. He's a real true technical expert in this field um, and is leading the, the, the charge in terms of the application of technology to, um, to car visualization at Volvo Cars. So wonderful to have him here today. And we're also joined by Ruth Bachi. Ruth is a cloud architect, a solutions architect at Microsoft Azure. Um, and Ruth was the, the hands-on person helping us set up the infrastructure, um, the cloud infrastructure required to, to run these supercomputers that, that made this project a reality. So wonderful to have you here, Ruth. And then lastly, um, Perry Nightingale, my, um, my partner in crime here at, at WPP. Perry is our head of creative AI at WPP. That's a real title, by the way, um, something to aspire to. It's not a title that, that exists a couple of years ago, but we are very proud to have a, a head of creative AI here. And Perry, like, like Matthias, is also an artist and a technologist and a developer. Um, Perry um, is, 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 is probably one of the most um, uh, creative and imaginative autodidacts I've ever met in my life, um, and I'm privileged to work with them every day. Um, but Perry, you know, really kind of pulled this, this team together um, that, that made the, the work that you're going to see today, and, and, you know, very happy to, to have you here as well, Perry. So um, we're going to, to start with a, a couple of slides and, and a film just to kind of help set the stage in terms of what we're talking about. I think in this case, very much um, a picture is worth a thousand, uh, a thousand words. Um, there's, um, so, so I'm going to ask Perry just to kind of take 10, 15 minutes to, to set up the project, to explain to you why we were doing it, how we were doing it, um, to dig a little bit into the, the technology and the, the process that we, um, that we conducted, and then we'll get into a uh, panel discussion. So Perry, over to you. Thank you, Stefan. Kind words. 
one day I'm going to look up autodidact and see what it means. But um, so uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to share a couple of slides on 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 the project itself, right? Which started late last year, and and was our sort of R and D project looking at what the future of production looks like for our business, right? So WPP is one of the largest production companies in the world. We go on about 1,500 shoots a year, and you know, create hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pieces of content off the back of that, right? So we really wanted to explore what virtual production meant for that process. And for two reasons, one, uh, three reasons, actually, in a way, the first being that during the lockdown, we couldn't go anywhere, right? So instantly, you're less, you're less able to move talent around. The second reason was was environmental and sustainable. We've made promises to to society that we're going to bring our emissions down to zero, right? And obviously, fifteen hundred shoots and hundreds of trucks on each shoot is an enormous impact on the environment. And our clients have made those net zero commitments as well. So, you know, we're helping them to reach those goals. So the second was uh, was environmental, you know, and the third was exactly as Stefan said, you know, this this sort of immersive aspect, really, this ability to you know, to create a virtual world and for brands and customers to to come into that world to interact and to buy and to experience. So, you know, third, first we wanted to create a virtual set, right? I mean, you know, we're lucky we don't just get to to read and see what happens on on uh, productions like The Mandalorian. We get to we get to invest and explore those technologies ourselves, right? So we wanted to create a virtual set to go through that process, see what we could and couldn't achieve. But then we also wanted to see how virtual sets could change the way we market vehicles, right? And Volvo is really a marquee client in some of these areas. And, and we started this work with NVIDIA and at NVIDIA, we found uh, Matthias's team doing incredible work uh, around visualization. So it was a very natural fit. Um, you know, really looking at how a virtual set can be used in different in different touch points, which I'll go to in a second. So we drove up to Scotland, which was the largest natural forest with a decent skyline that we could find in this country. And I'll return to that point in a second. Drove up to the forest and we hired an oil and gas company. And I would say as well that in this modern collaborative world, you, you work with industries and partners you would never typically work with. So we work with an oil and gas company who flew drones up and down this road on the right and across this beautiful forest, um, capturing uh, point cloud data as they would do for a wind farm or, or an oil field or one of those sorts of things, right? Millimeter grade accuracy, because they're looking for cracks in wind turbines in, in um, usually. So very, very high, high fidelity scan. That creates this enormous point cloud, right? I mean, I, I didn't think they were going to scan the whole forest, but being oil and gas people, they came back with a 200 gigabyte, 10 billion point file with all of these points for the entire forest. That gets converted, and I'll touch on this in a few slides, into this beautiful mesh, right? I mean, honestly, this is, this is an object. It's just one of the most stunning things. This is one tiny section of what is about a mile of road and sort of several square miles of, of forest in unimaginable detail. I mean, you can literally see here and there insects, right, on some on some of the on some of the bark. That's how high, you know, high fidelity the, the scanning was. And then back in a big studio, we create an LED display wall, right, which is this generational shift in, in creation, creating content pioneered by the Mandalorian. The, that is a sort of bank of um, high resolution televisions. 20 meters or something like that usually and that you can see the back of it on the left and and we display the forest on the front of it so you can see us controlling the forest scene with you know it was, it was just a really incredible experiment to be honest this piece testing the the lenses with canon um, and you film against that right which is tremendously liberating for the director because you can you know you can plan your shots better you know you can be more immersed in it it's not a flat green screen you know once it's done it's done right once you've shot it you've shot it and a whole load of technologies have really converged to make this possible high-end compute from nvidia that makes it real time enough to sort of move the camera and the trees and the angles to change you know the, the pixel resolution that makes it convincing i mean standing in front of this scene there were times out of the corner of your eye where where you were back in that forest it was really quite quite incredible the, the core technology and the NVIDIA people call themselves NVIDIANs, which I think sounds a little bit alien sometimes, uh, was this technology called Omniverse, which they, they really developed with Pixar over the last four years. As Pixar grew, 
it, it sort of had different studios around the world working on a single scene, right? Now, one studio might be character specialists and one, one might be texture specialists. So, you know, they found that very unwieldy, right? So they, they started working with NVIDIA to, to develop a platform that would allow different, different parts of Pixar to collaborate on the same film. Um, and at the same time, because that was the way the technology were converging, they also had one real time ray traced view of the whole thing. Right. So multiple artists can be, you know, sketching the textures, designing the models, building the scene, animating the characters. And all of them have this window into the film that is constant um, and, and very high, you know, high acceleration on those graphics which brings another level of real-time automotive realism, both to WPP and to companies like Volvo, right? So this is one of our renders, but I mean, you know, um, Matthias is uh, hard to tell from the real world a lot of the time. So, you know, you're able to see this for real, right? And it's a real privilege of this job that I get to see what games consoles are gonna look like in a decade's time, right? <laughs> that is, you know, if you if you had a $250,000, um, you know, budget for a games console, go to Roof would be my first point of contact and you'll be able to play things that look a little bit like this, right? It's very hard to tell them from the, from the real thing. You know, we approached this project as if we'd been tasked with a real film, right? With a real ad, we approached it as if Volvo had come to us and said, you know, we wanna launch the next car um, you know, we want to tell a story about, you know, about a life in a forest or whatever it might have been, right? So we really did approach it as if it was a real film with a real location, with a real budget. We went through the whole process as if this was a real thing, right? Um, you know, one of the key things was that creating our film in that way, and I'd say this is probably the most crucial side of the entire presentation, allows us to give that asset to Volvo to complete the vehicle inside the finished customer proposition, Matthias calls it, the ad ultimately, the brand world. Because today, three months before the car is finished, a CAD model is thrown over the wall to the marketing agency and the marketing agency will, you know, will go and complete their ad and the car will be finished in something much more abstract. And the two come together really on launch day. And, and I think what's so exciting about technology today is that it brings companies together, right? Actually, tools like USD, um, which is the file format this is based on, and Omniverse, you know, they really and, and they really allow companies to to work together towards a common goal at a technical level, right? Not just where we get together around the table and say, wouldn't it be good if, you know, we are we are putting the plumbing in place for businesses to work seamlessly, right? To co-create seamlessly to build sort of one environment really for, for the customer. We're also very interested that when these platforms exist, that the customers themselves can come and finish their vehicles inside this environment, right? Like, you know, it's really about your life, you know, the, the context in which you'll use your car, that, that you ought to be, you know, you ought to be coloring it and configuring it and, and all the rest of that really. So, you know, I think we see, we see a point fairly soon where the immersion of this leads to experiences that that really sort of allow the the customer to feel and experience the car in context right which isn't which isn't the case today basically um and for roof i mean i have to say the the you know there was a moment of terror really when we realized how big the point cloud was and we thought we were going to have to go to to stefan and the exec and say yeah so this the experiment was a complete success and they'd have said cool can we see it and we said no there's not going to be a computer around to open it for another 10 years which basically you know you will definitely be able to open it one day um you know so so we went to roof and sort of said we we really need a machine that is going to turn these points into into this mesh right and just to give you a sense there's 10 billion points and every single point needs all of its neighboring points you know within five meters around the point to be looked at and analyzed for patterns right it is an unimaginable mathematical task to do that right it you know for five square miles of forest probably you know probably one of the most advanced technical tasks you could imagine akin to predicting the weather really and roof and i constructed what is absolutely a supercomputer um you know we we basically assembled nine of the most powerful uh, gpu machines available on on azure today that had eight tesla v100s between you know each so there were 72 tesla v100s right which was probably a portion of the v100s in western europe i'm sure roof won't give us a number um and uh two M416s, which are 416 vCPUs each, right? So all in all, we had nearly 1,200 vCPUs. 
and the 26, 28 terabytes of RAM. So it was 11 terabytes of RAM on both of those. We broke a computing record at WPP with that, with those two machines alone. And to move the, the point cloud onto the cards and onto those instances to do the processing, Roof set up for us a, a, a virtual file share system that connected at four and a half terabytes a second, which um, was her nickname ever after, four and a half terabytes a second roof. Um, you know, really a kind of another level. And I think, you know, what, what she'll discuss in the session with Stefan is, is the incredible power we have in, in, our, in our hands today to create these machines on demand. Ten years ago, this machine would have been millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? And I couldn't have made a single mistake. It would have been a firing offense to have, to have commissioned a machine like that and turned around and said, sorry, it's not fit for purpose. And I think, you know, this wasn't that hard, right? I'm not an Azure engineer by any stretch of the imagination. And to build something like this for, for a task like that is, is just revolutionary, to be totally honest. It, it really changed the way we think about computing for these things. Um, you know, this is this is ongoing work, right? We're starting to see the car and the forest brought together. We're beginning to film virtually inside this environment, right? The director is relearning how to be a director today, actually. Like, you know, there's no longer a location. There's just the shot and the location and the shot are one and the same, right? And, you know, the configurator and the film and the ad and, and the design environment are all one thing. And we're really sort of exploring over the next sort of two months what that really means. But whatever, it has changed the way that WPP makes film forever. It has made it more sustainable, you know, and I think there's a bit of poignancy when I look at this image because, you know, we drove a long way for that forest, right? And I don't want to live in a future where forests are these forests, the virtual. I want, you know, I want to keep the ones we've got, to be totally honest. So the environmental and the sustainable side of this is more important than it ever really was. Um, and, the, and the sort of project itself has been a huge success already. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna play a 50 second film that was played at the NVIDIA GTC keynote. Almost 10 million people around the world have seen this project and, and what we did. It's a short film and it really talks to the partnership on, uh, you know, that NVIDIA brought to the table as well. And then Stefan and the team are gonna unpack it a little bit. So yeah, I hope that makes sense. And here's the film. WPP is the largest marketing services organization on the planet. And because of that, we're also one of the largest production companies in the world. That is a major carbon hotspot for us. We've partnered with NVIDIA to capture locations virtually and bring them to life in studios with Omniverse. Over 10 billion points are turned into a giant mesh in Omniverse. For the first time, we can shoot locations virtually that are as real as the actual places themselves. Omniverse also changes the way we make work. A collaborative platform that means multiple artists at multiple points in the pipeline in multiple parts of the world can collaborate on a single scene. Real-time CGI and sustainable studios, collaboration with Omniverse, is the future of film at WPP. Thank you, Perry. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I've seen that story several times, but every every time I see it, it still inspires me and it gives me it gives me a kick. Um, particularly the, the supercomputer and the uh, and the the one <laughs> you you put in place there. Um, I'm I'm, I'm going to start the the um, discussion with with Matthias. I mean, Matthias, uh, you know, clearly as someone who's sort of devoted your career to um, to working in this field, and um, you know, this this project must have been quite a kick for you, right? I mean, just to to have a group of companies come together, you know, to to do something in a very collaborative way with, with you know largely sort of unfettered um you know kind of scope in terms of, of you know experimenting with what we can do here. um but but maybe you can just 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 give the audience a little bit more context in terms of, of your job you know how how it's evolved from being a, a sort of a cgi artist to you know kind of a really you know technology lead in this area for volvo cars um, and I've got a couple of follow-up questions for you regarding omniverse specifically but if you can maybe just start with the the sort of the main um, you know, how did you get into this area? You know, and how did you evolve from the the kind of applied side into the technology side of it? Uh, for sure. I mean, uh, I've always been uh, drawn to sort of the combination between between the creative and the sort of computer graphics. It's sort of the uh, ultimate uh, merging of both the technology and the creative side, and to see that come alive in front of you—that's really something special. So I actually started at Volvo in 2006, I think. And I was more focusing on the visualization aspects, helping out in the everyday 
helping with the design visualizations and uh, selling the design internally and also help visualizing and make this virtual product manifest itself for a, a greater audience. But then I've uh, more and more focused on sort of the uh, the behind the scenes, sort of in the shadows, sort of right like like the lighting is right now, to be honest, in the dark. No, not really, but what actually lies behind, because uh, as you said, and we've talked about uh, already, that we can create these fantastic virtual worlds with sort of hyper-realism and everything, but we still, in our daily work, encounter these sort of blockers, just, for example, exchanging data between different softwares and sort of, and I really feel that, uh, I mean, technology is really there to enrich people's lives. I mean, no matter if you're working as a designer, you just want to visualize your software or, or your product, uh, or if the end customer wants to experience and sort of, uh, yeah, look around, get a feeling for the car. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so would, would you say that, that one of the biggest blockers in, in doing that until recently was the, the, the lack of interoperability between the software packages that you needed to use to, to do this work? I mean, was that was kind of cross-platform cross and cross-software collaboration really the biggest issue? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we haven't really had a purposeful interchange format yet not one that was actually uh, meant to be. And especially also taking into consideration sort of the collaborative aspects. So that's what I'm, I mean, I've been working with computer graphics for 20, 25 years. And I think right in this moment, I think I'm, it's the most exciting times ever because we see these uh, convergence sort of, I mean, I think a lot of people are feeling the same, that it is a struggle to actually just exchange data. And we want to solve this uh, problem in a fundamental way once for all so we kind of can unleash this creativity that i mean uh, yeah get lost in conversions and just time getting wasted on uh, stuff we should have technology solving for us so that's why i'm that so interested yeah yeah, and that's really what what's in video with the um, USD Universal Scene Description format, you know, and Omniverse is bringing yeah. to to this field, right? I mean, it's a sort of idea of of multiple different software packages and tools, you know, collaborating on one platform through one through one standard format, right? Yeah, and uh, big uh, shout out to Pixar who actually open sourced USD back in two thousand and sixteen to sort of unleash it and uh, let it loose into the world. And I mean, for sure. Uh, it's been mainly used inside of the VFX and ME industry, but now we're seeing it actually getting hold of different industries. I mean, the usage is picking up in uh, yeah, more manufacturing, architecture, and we see, uh, I mean, everyone was looking for something like this. And uh, I mean, USD is not only a, uh, it's not only a file format, it's sort of a platform, I would say. Uh, it's sort of the, uh, now we have a common denominator that's really good that we can utilize to actually, I mean, from our sake, it's actually, we're, we're able to sort of express our product data and keep sort of uh, the product data alive throughout the uh, process. And one of the things that, I mean, collaboration is already built into USD. So uh, with that, we can actually uh, change our workflows from, I mean, as Perry talked about earlier, it's not going to be these sequential, we don't want these sequential steps where we do something, then throw it over the fence to the other guy who continues. For sure, you can sort of shorten every step to make it closer, but sort of the uh, obvious way is just to make the workflows parallel. And the only way to do that is actually to have a some sort of common denominator that's built for these collaborative uh, workflows. So we're, I mean, we're excited to sort of connect the chains from the different ends, sort of the uh, creative designers in the beginning working, I mean, crossing over with the uh, creatives in the end and sort of have one unified universe for storytelling. I mean, that's sort of the dream. Yeah. No, and, and that and that's really powerful because I think in the you know this idea of of using the same the same platform and software tools to design the products but also to visualize them for consumers in terms of, of marketing communications is really a completely radical process. I mean, you know, or radical idea that that's never been possible before. This it's always been linear and sequential and and, and handoffs in between. That's great. And and 
you know, so so I think I just want to move on to Ruth for for a second. So Ruth, from your perspective, right? I mean, you you work with a lot of um, you know startups, scale ups, you know, technology companies, etc. Um, you know, when when you started working with Perry on this project, I mean, did, did you did you have a little bit of a sense of you know, oh my God, what is this guy doing? Or <laughs> what what was what was your what was your reaction to the project? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. One of the great things about CloudRay is that it provides that democratization of compute. You know, one of Azure's key differentiators is, is the sort of the low barrier to entry, you know, the easily consumable cloud services. Now that in combination with the right approach, you know, the ability to dive in, get hands on, you know, learn and fail fast, you know, it, for me, I mean, it definitely provides a perfect co cocktail for innovation sort of thing. But honestly, it was astonishing to watch Perry sort of a creative create on on azure um i mean before i could blink literally he had eight vms up and running with tesla gpus um and all i really needed to help him with was some of the networking components the configuration and sort of achieving you know the performance storage throughput so that the mesh uh, nodes could write to storage layer simultaneously um obviously to get the throughput speeds we needed to process the amount of data you know, and Perry, by his own admission, um, just you've heard him say, he's not an expert in cloud tech, um, but he rolled his sleeves in, he got he got stuck stuck, stuck into the building the, the, the solution, and that's what works if you want to be able to innovate with cloud technology. And Ruth, I mean, so, so you know, we spoke with Matthias about the, you know, historical limitations in terms of the, the creative and, and the software platforms and process. But, you know, clearly this is not a cheap computer, right? I mean, if, if, if you know, and, and, and I think one of the one of the key barriers, obviously, still in terms of these sort of hyper real immersive environments, especially when you start personalizing them, is that, you know, it becomes expensive to, to deploy that um, at scale for millions of consumers. So, you know, as, as you as you, you look at the, the evolution of Azure and the way that that supports these sort of, you know, very compute intensive workloads, you know, what do you think is the is the the future of of this kind of experience do you think we, we're going to get to a point quite soon where where this is truly available as as a mass consumer um solution or do you think it's it's still it's, it's going to stay in this sort of area of r d and experimentation for a couple more years well I, I think if you look at the power now and and across you know all the three main cloud providers there's some serious compute there now you know um it, it, you know i think there's either even bigger machines and virtual machines available um than than what perry used in, in in this scenario um but i think you know if we think about you know i think generally we now we've reached a point uh, where the power and the capability of cloud compute is compatible if not exceeding you know the compute performance that we could get on premises uh, you know with well connected solutions you know if we think about scaling you know the global accessibility of compute resources that are available immediately on, on demand you know in this instance it's avoided WPP engaging in any lengthy uh, CapEx procurement process and kind of, you know, really provided the ability to scale up not only vertically in terms of the virtual machines, but horizontally in terms of how many virtual machines and not just in one Azure region, but in the future, you know, to scale globally quickly, you know, to meet the demands of your global customers as well. So it's it's a brilliant combination. Yeah, and I think you know the 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 way we think about this is really that you know clearly um, running running this process in order to create this 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 virtual world this virtual set um, you know was was you know compute intensive and, and actually you know probably had a uh, an environmental impact in terms of the amount of power that it used and so on and you know Microsoft you know has has published its its goals in terms of net zero and, and carbon negative for its data centers but. You know the, the 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 way to think about it is not just in terms of the the net new um, you know carbon footprint of that process, but also what are we what are we replacing it with? And in our case, you know across WPP um, production, uh, the process of of content production um, accounts for about fifteen percent of our total carbon emissions. And and so you know the, the the fact that we didn't have to fly an entire crew up to Scotland, all the actors, the director, the clients, the agency folks, you know everything that goes with that, um, means that our our sort of carbon footprint of actually capturing the the, the scene and the set that can now be reused many many times, um, you know is a fraction of of the of the the sort of related um, you know 
carbon impact of the compute. Um, I mean, do you do you have a, a lot of clients um, at Microsoft or come to Microsoft now putting sustainability as one of the key objectives, um, the key kind of business requirements in terms of working with Azure? Um, how, how big a factor is that for you today? Yeah, it's it's it, it's a it's a massive business for us to be honest. Uh, you know. It, our, our efforts in sustainability are twofold. Um, you know, what we're doing now to help our customers, but also the investments we're making in our own data centers as well. So, yes, you know, Microsoft have have all those sustainable um, targets, like 100% renewable energy by 2025, water positive by 2020. You know, there's a whole list of them. Um, you can just go to our website and have a look at them. Um, but you know, the majority of our investment in sustainability is going towards the sustainability efficiencies uh, you know truly in our data centers you know studies have reported that microsoft cloud you know we're looking at savings up to 93 percent more energy efficient and up to 98 percent more carbon uh, efficient than traditional on-premise data centers so those savings are a result of a journey that sort of microsoft has been on over a decade ago um, you know, but so be, even by WPP using those cloud services for this project is a step in the in the right direction in terms of you know your sustainability goals. And it's the same. You know, we have other organisations, you know, such as um, Maersk using uh, you know IoT solutions to you know to track the sensors um, placed on the vessels to help and analyse the data um, using their you know business intelligence platform. Uh, just really to be able to enable them to create energy official models uh, that will eventually mean that they can operate the vessels in a more sustainable way. And, you know, the list list goes on in terms of the customers that are not only using our data centers, but are building solutions using our IoT platform um, and uh, easily consumable uh, templates to enable them to, to do that easily. Yeah, wonderful. And, and Perry, I mean, you know, as you know, um, you know, the, the the wonderful thing about this project is that the this this project inspired our production um, business at WPP Hogarth to adopt a, a sustainably made, um, you know, effectively um, business process where um, going forward, you know, they they're really kind of adopting these these production processes as the standard way that they're going to work, um, you know, as far as possible. Now, can you talk just a little bit more about this idea of of you know not only sustainable production but also content recycling and and how you know what you learned through this project in terms of content recycling and opportunity with that you know again working with, with Volvo. Yeah a number of things happened during that that virtual production shoot. First of all we began to think about the studios we would shoot them in right and we have a real commitment at WPP to sustainable campuses you know and sustainable studio environments right we were developing those and, and, a, and a sustainability sort of message began to sort of seep into how we were thinking about the work. And another big area um, is, is recycling of footage, right? We saw on this shoot, as there are on all shoots, the ratio of filming to, you know, footage to film is 200 to one. So for every minute that goes into an ad or a feature film for that matter, 200 minutes of beautiful footage, mostly beautiful footage, sits on a shelf and never gets used, right? So, you know, we're working with we're working with Microsoft to think about, you know, how to go into our archive. I mean, we've been making film for 25 years, right? So if you if you multiply that up, it's a lot of beautiful films sitting there not doing anything. Using AI to go into that archive to find the right film to adapt it for for the sort of um, you know for the gaps in the film and and just really think about film in a, in a more sustainable you know sort of environmentally positive way right so that that was very influenced by this project to be honest and if we um, can you talk about the the actual the actual calculations and metrics um, in terms of the 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 carbon difference between doing shooting this traditionally and um, and filming it in this way have we have you done the the full calculations on that yet. Yeah, and you know, I think to be honest, I talk a lot about energy control, right? It's, it's, you know, the, the you're not going to get an accurate figure until until you're actually using this in a production environment, right? Because the kilowatt per hour, you know, that we used on the on the mesh processing, for example, at the moment is carbon offset. In a couple of years, that'll be fully renewable, so that will make a big difference. And carbon offset is its own discussion, um, but you have energy control in a studio that you don't have in in the field right so when you have to go out into a forest or you have to go abroad you, you have to take your energy generation with you right and that's that's where the energy consumption is worse in this in a studio particularly in in many developed markets you can make sure you're buying renewable energy and you can also have a more i mean it's a small thing to end on but a more diverse team 
working on the shoe, right? I mean, we sort of talk a lot about accessibility, which I'm sure will be a, a session we'll run at Colgate's next year. But as well as more, you know, bigger variety and more diverse group of people get to work on the film where you have control over where it's made, right? And there's always going to be a mix. I'm not taking locations away from the film process. But uh, it's as much about energy control at this point as it is about total consumption. Wonderful. And, and we, we, we're drawing to a close. So I just want to get back to Matthias. And, and you know, Matthias, this is obviously, you know, there, there's the, the, this is a craft and a, a sort of a, um, a wonderful, you know, sort of technology stroke art form by itself, right? But I think ultimately, you know, we're clearly doing this to, to sell products and in your case, to sell cars. Um, and, and you've spoken a lot in the past about this idea that the, the, the configurator will become the showroom of the future. And, and you know, when, when, I, when, when I say that, people kind of go, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, configurators are just sort of toys, you know, that spin cars around on your on your desktop. But I mean, talk a little bit about your vision for what what does that mean? What what, what do we have to do, and and you know, where do we need to get to before the conf configurator can become the showroom of the future? No, I think I mean, at this point now, we're getting there where we because I mean, the uh, the car is uh, arguably the most complex consumer product out there. So we've always faced this issue of you no, know, the data sets are too big. No, we can't visualize it. We have to optimize it. We have to make it less great than we want to. But compute is sort of catching up. And we've, uh, like the uh, work done in this project with data acquisition and sort of outscanning the world, all, our, all these things are falling into place. And I mean, it's not just these massive data acquisition efforts like in this project, but you you nowadays have devices with LiDAR scanning, and uh, it's also how do we actually get the consumer or the end customer involved and getting a more in context? How can they affect the experience in the future? Uh, I think switching from, I mean, car configurators sound so uh, uh, clinical in a way. It's more like a uh, car machine storytelling device. It's not really uh, the configuration itself uh, is not the uh, important it's more what kind of stories you can tell the, doing it sort of and that's uh, i think moving from a now most of the times the customer has this 2d snapshot of time and space but when that snapshot becomes a fully dynamic 3d immersive environment to actually explore the car then the possibilities and the as a storytelling device becomes something completely new and then uh, it's up to us to really create this what is the kick the tire experience and sort of build the so that's why it's so interesting with the sort of collaborative aspects to build. It's not just the car, it will integrate into a universe in context and everything sort of has to. And then this aspect of actually aggregating data, connecting universes in the future as well, is also a very interesting uh, aspect to uh, uh, look into. Absolutely. Matthias, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very much looking forward to continuing on this journey with you and to help you realize that vision with, with our team here. Um, Perry, Ruth, Matthias, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful session and a very exciting area for me. Um, and thank you for um, having us. Wow, how wonderful. Thank you so much for really, really interesting insight into how you kind of blend craftsmanship with data, technology and art. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody, please come back at one o'clock. We've got an amazing session on crypto art, the impact that it has on the um, creation, production and collection of art. And also to remind you that every year the Creative Industries Council shines a light on a hundred innovative young startups and ideas. So not just businesses, but concepts. It's called the Creative Wants to Watch. Nominations close on Friday. If you would like to nominate somebody or yourself, please head to thecreativeindustries.co.uk thecreativeindustries.co.uk thank you very much see you back here at one o'clock